I think that the best security co- products give you peace of mind. I think that um, when I installed, uh, uh, I don't know, like for example, an EDR in my company, I had peace of mind that like I think that my work workstations are secure. So I think that a good security product not necessarily operates in the background, but operates in a way that's not bothersome for uh, the organization. So you do have a dashboard that you can look in, but I see like that we attach ourselves to your organizational workflows, uh, whether it's a ticketing system, a SIM, uh, also our solution, or just send your notifications via Slack. But first thing that we do is we build an inventory. You can see in one place, all of the anonymous and identities that you have, all of the entitlements, all of the authentication methods, uh, the owners of those identities and the usage that uh, you do it. On top of that inventory, we provide multiple applications. Most popular application to start with is to reduce risk. You want to identify the top 10 uh, most critical identities. We like it to call it the most wanted, like the identity sheriff is coming to town and trying to like uh, ma- ma- like to catch the, the biggest criminal. So that's like the most wanted board. Now, Jenny take, Sheriff, uh, is that domain name taken? Because that might be one you want to jump on next. <laughs> we have we have something here. Yeah. I'll <laughs> follow up like right after this recording and check that if that domain is available. Um, I think that Jim is doing it right now, but you yeah. know, not to point fingers. This is identity at the center. If it has anything to do with IAM, this is the go-to podcast. Now your hosts, Jim McDonald and Jeff Stedman. Welcome to the Identity the Center podcast. I'm Jeff and that's Jim. Hey, Jim. Hey, Jeff. How are you? Oh, not so bad yourself? Great. I'm excited for this episode. Um, we're, we've got a guest on to talk about machine identities. And I think this is one of the areas of digital identity, or I'll even call it identity and access management. We've been in it long enough. We can call it that. And this has been a problem since day one. So uh, I'm glad to see the industry is taking it seriously. And folks like we're going to talk to today are building solutions. Yeah, I feel like this is like, the Zoolander meme with uh, the Will Ferrell character, you know, non-human identity, so hot right now, <laughs> you know. <laughs> so we're going to get into that. Uh, today mm-hmm. is a sponsored episode, yeah. so sponsor yeah. spotlights. These are things that we create with our sponsors to help uh, understand the points of view that they bring to the identity space. So make it crystal clear. They have sponsored this episode in full. Uh, we're going to hear f- today from Token Security. You can visit them on the web with a very easy to remember token.security website. It is a very cool website, one of the best that I've seen. So I would definitely encourage people to go check it out. We're really well done on the web design, uh, but we're not here to talk web design. We're here to talk about non-human identity, uh, machine identity. They have a tagline to go machine first. We're going to find out what that means. So I'd like to welcome to the show, Ido Shlomo. He's the co-founder and CTO of Token Security. Welcome, Ido. Thank you, Jess. Thank you, Jim, for hosting me. Um, <laughs> Definitely one of the highlights of my life. <laughs> well, you know, that's fair and flattery will absolutely get you everywhere uh, on this podcast. So I appreciate that. But we'd like to understand a little bit more about yourself. Uh, how did you get into the space of identity? Is it something that you chose or did it choose you? I you know, like, um, I think that I have a classical nerve story that took a very, very interesting twist. Um, and so in very, very short, I am, as a teenager, I, I mastered online gaming. That was like something that I like to do. One of the things that I like to do the most actually up until today, I started a, a gaming server on my personal computer at home, um, built my own registration panel and a hacker, which was probably one of my, uh, high school competitors, um, hacked it by, uh, bypassing the authentication. And then I was like, okay, there is something here with this authentication. Um, I, I was drafted into the army, uh, when I was 18, um, and from there I started my path, like my career path in terms of, um, cyber operations, uh, vulnerability research, implant development. And I learned exactly that, that like the exact, op- like the exact other side of how do you exploit identity? And while a lot of my friends had amazing talent in vulnerability research, I used to like just find the credential that was lying around somewhere and use it. And it was something that I thought was like a cheat code. 
and eventually ended up serving a short term of uh, 13 years in, in the Israeli army in cyber operations um, and decided that the military life was not for me. Um, and when I finished my service, I, I wanted to to do something like that would uh, that might change the world, but also something that I'm good at. And I remember like all of those credentials that we found lying around. And like, then I saw that a machine identity security is a very, very real problem and decided to go and start a company on around that concept. So that's how I got into, into this space. Um, eventually, uh, like lately we've seen so many breaches, like the Snowflake hack of Ticketmaster and so on that were machine identity led, uh, that, that also like reality is, uh, uh, it's showing that it's a very, very big problem right now. Yeah, it seems to be everywhere, and it's just going to proliferate, right? As more things come into the into the world that are doing other things, right? Bots, AI, right? Servers, IoT, right? There's a whole bunch of stuff that's going to be out there. I'd like to learn more about token security because people may not be familiar with the company itself. So, tell us about token security. What is the problem that you guys are looking to solve, and what do you bring to the market? Okay, so. I think that like building software is, is super hard and then you want to find the right tool for, for your task and you pick a certain menu of technology that is super wide. Like you have SaaS services, you have database technologies, you have workloads technologies like containers, function and server and whatnot. You are multi-cloud, you work with Kubernetes and each one of the technologies that I just said is implementing its own identity mechanism, uh, at least authorization, but also a lot of times, like also authentication. And then what happens is that you have thousands of different uh, uh, identities that was caused by a huge fragmentation of that space. So like everybody creates its own identity provider. And then when in human identity, you wear the one single source of truth, so which is your SSO provider, uh, in machine identity, every uh, Every asset manages its own identity. And that's how we, we came up with Go Machine First. Like we want to attack the identity problem, but like with a machine first approach that look at the asset that you want to protect and not necessarily your identity provider. And so we got into this space and tried to understand like, what's the problem here? Like, why is this so uh, problematic for organizations to, to solve? And we saw that on top of the fragmentation that created the big scale issue of identities, there were two main problems that organizations were facing. One is the ability to find the human owner of each identity. And second one was to acquit that owner with the, all of the data that they need on the identity, both the static parameters, but also the dynamic usage um, in order to solve, for example, a key rotation problem or a stale identity or an over permissive service account and so on. So that's in a nutshell, the problem that we are solving. Okay, you perked my ears up here now because when you say try to find the owner of a machine or a non-human identity, I mean, every, every organization I've talked to struggles with that. Who owns this account? It was created 5, 10, 15, 30 years ago. <laughs> and, you know, who's responsible for that? So I'm definitely interested to learn more about this. I think that kind of speaks to the importance too of this area of who owns these accounts? Because if you don't know who is responsible for the account, how are you supposed to secure it? Does it have the right permissions? Is it doing what it was intended to do? Has it been hijacked to be used for something else? Now, that could be benign, right? It happens a lot. Server's account might get used for something else. Or it could be, hey, maybe uh, an attacker is pay is piggybacking on a service account that they probably shouldn't be doing that, right? Is that make sense from a kind of trying to define why this is so important? Are there other things you want to add to that? Yeah, I think that it, it's split into two, but like... Yeah, I think that identifying the internal order is super important. For, for example, sometimes we see that the most critical accounts in organizations were created by individuals that already left the company, for example. So the ownership data is really crucial to identify which part of the organization is responsible. How do I assign uh, like the, the handling and the lifecycle management of process of that identity? Second part is really the usage, as you said. So when an identity is spread across thousands of containers with one database user and password that all of those containers are using. You want to expose this, le this level of dependencies and usage to find out what is the real use of that service account. I think that visibility in non-human identity is one of the key, um, key problems. So it's not only a hazard of like, um, 
integrating with all types of products, but also identifying the usage patterns of the identities themselves. So I want to make sure that we're speaking the same language. When you say non-human identity or machine identity, can you define that for me? Like, what is your your definition of what that means? Yeah. Well, so, so many terms right now, like machine identity, machine account, service account, API key, everybody likes to call it a, a bit differently. So let's scope where we're at. Um, what I'm most, uh, um, what I worry for the most is the identities that could lead to your core technology and, and to affect your critical resources. So what, what's not in token security scope? It's not endpoint identity. It's not your employees' workstations or laptops. It's not IoT. It's not the uh, voice over IP device that you have or the camera that you have installed. Even those, those, like, even though those are machines, um, it's not what we're handling. And also, we are not handling public key infrastructure. It's not the client to server encryption part. What we worry about is the identities that are mainly you are all were intended for programmatic use inside your core technology, inside your core assets, and could affect it. It could be a Salesforce integration API key. That could be a service account in your AWS. That could be an SSH key that opens all of your EC2 instances or other servers. It could be a Snowflake service account. But that's the area and the attitude that, that we are working with. So I am always interested in how you come up with names for companies these days. How did you come up with the name Token Security? What was the, the driver behind that? Okay. So let me tell you a bit of a funny story. So you know how a lot of uh, founders in cybersecurity come from Israel. And what we're known for in Israel is that we have extreme self-confidence. We like to really be certain that we ride at what we're doing. So my partner and I, we chose a name for the company. We chose a name. We already registered a domain. And the name was like something that was supposed to bring light into a doubt problem in the cloud. And we chose the name Moonlight Security. And we were certain that we, it was a fantastic name. We sent our friend an intro request to one of his investors. And he asked for us, like, send me your email address. And I sent him it, it at Moonlight Security. And he told me, did you look that up in the dictionary before you signed the domain? Like, what did you, uh, why did you pick that name? And then I understand that Moonlight has a very, very different uh, uh, meaning than what I thought. And so we went back to the drawing board. And we understood that everything about um, machine identity and the fact that like what happened in reality is that what people are looking in non-human identity is to regain trust. Token is the symbol and basically the essence of trust. Uh, it's something that also is the core of the problem that we are solving. Token compromise um, in very, very different ways is probably the main attack vector that attackers are using today. Um, and so it it's bo- it both symbolizes the space and the problem that we're looking to solve. And so that's how we pick the name token. And the URL token.security was available. So that's even like a bonus, right? <laughs> yeah. Everybody thinks that we're in a crypto, <laughs> cryptocurrency, but, uh, you know, we're building a non even identity space to take over that. <laughs> so let me put my jaded CISO hat on. I see a lot of products out there. What sets you apart from others in the space uh, that you're operating in? Like, what makes you different? Yeah. So we, a, a lot of vendors exist today in NHI, like in non-human identity. Um, it's important to explain what do you need in order to solve the non-human identity problem. And eventually that mm-hmm. leads for very, very different applications. So I will talk about the applications for a moment. I will just explain like how you should look at, at an NHI event or what makes token special. So I think that we invest in, in core of three main value proposition. One is that we want to be the only vendor that you need for learning an identity. I don't, I think that too many companies are trying to narrow down their offering to look at a specific technology, like only cloud providers or only SaaS to SaaS integrations and so on. I want to be your non-human identity provider, so on for end for self-hosted workloads, for a database that you can't access uh, easily. I want to cover your cloud native identities. I want to cover your SaaS, uh, SaaS services and also eventually or cover um, customer integration that are done programmatically, which is also a type of non-human identity. Uh, um, sh- am I, are we there? We might not be there yet, but okay. we are aiming to give you as full coverage as possible. 
second part is basically trying yeah. to solve uh, or, or starting to solve your operational efficiency problem. So a lot of people can handle one service yeah. account. Handling multiple or handling the entire service account fabric that you have um, is very, very uh, mm -hmm. hard. What you need to do is to harness the entire organization for that. In order to harness the organization, you need to identify internal owner or to provide ownership for service account, connecting the non-human identity to a human identity. Third part is to equip those internal owners with the data that they need. Um, we want to give you all of the data that you need be, uh, in order to remediate or in order to improve your security posture in non-human identity, because the thing that both engineer that, that like is shared between engineering, DevOps, SRE, and security is that we fear to break stuff. I want you to have complete certainty that you can uh, take action and have all of the data that you need in order to take that action. And so the dynamic usage uh, layer that we put on top of our inventory is one of the most crucial parts of an anonymous identity solution. With that data layer, you can do everything. You can reduce risk. You can uh, operate very, very efficiently. You can stand to compliance frameworks. You can do everything that you want. You can do lifecycle management, key to have coverage, ownership, and uh, usage. So, you know, this is a solution focused on the enterprise, right? So it's going to be enterprise mm -hmm. identity mm -hmm. leaders that are going to look at the product, right? And I, I kind of feel like mm -hmm. as an enterprise mm -hmm. identity practitioner, they're used to certain lanes. So you got your IGA lane, you've got your access management lane, you've got your privilege access yeah. management lane. ITDR is certainly kind of like becoming a lane. I don't know that it's established itself as a lane yet. Is token security in one of those lanes or is it different? Is it is machine identity becoming its own lane? That's a great question. Um, sure. I think that I don't uh, like solving the same problem in a better way a lot of times. Like that's that's a part of my personality and what I believe when I founded a company that we need to find a new problem. And then non human identity problem, it had certain like solutions that were peripheral to it. For example, power solutions such as CyberArk or, or the linear beyond trust and strong DM. Um, they manage credentials, right? Like they take service accounts and they allow you to access them securely, but they work mainly for human beings. And also they were born on-prem. They were born for a limited amount of servers. They were not born for the scale of the cloud. And so when people ask me if I would ever, if I imagine that non-human identity would be in one of the, those lands, I would say that it's like describing um, a cloud as a very fast horse. Um, I don't think that like, I think that it's an entirely new area that is here to, to last. Um, as long as people are building software, as long as they are utilizing um, the internet and APIs, I think that non-human identity will be uh, separated from human identity solutions. Yeah, I you know, I, I kind of feel like with non-human identities, they require a lot of the same technology or processes as human identities, right? But they're not always, you know, one for one or they don't work the same. So you still need to have a life cycle, you know, the creation of the account, the destruction of the account when it's no longer needed. You need to have some kind of governance. So there has to be some kind of human who is accountable for that account and needs to determine, yes, it has the right permissions, things like that. So that's kind of the identity. And then also from an access management standpoint, is authentication. It probably needs some kind of rotation of the credentials and things like that. So the first part I think of is like the IGA duties. The second part I think of is privilege access management duties. But all those things break down. Like, you know, we have best practices when it comes to dealing with humans. Like the humans come from the HR system. Um, and for, for a user, a human perspective, you can do multi-factor authentication and okay. you can have a human being change the password every so often. Well, machines don't work that way, right? 
um, non-human accounts don't work that way. So I guess maybe <laughs> you know, rambling out a little bit, but what I wanted to get to was, so how does token security work? How do you address those different areas or which of those areas do you address? That's a great question. So in order to not be repetitive, I want to share an interesting story. I want to share something that's like the true essence of why non human identity is such a hard problem. And it's a, an anonymous, anonymous case study that we did with one of our customers. Um, about a real life event that happens for them. Um, luckily that event, uh, um, ended up in a, um, with a good result because we were there, but let's try to, to visualize like the problem in a very, very real story kind of way. So you have, uh, for example, some kind of a SaaS service that holds very sensitive data. It could be one password. It could be your Google Drive. Um, what we identified. Uh, that on a certain day, um, one of the service accounts that came from an identity provider um, was compromised. And that service account had a password and an MSA. It was perfectly um, safe for human access, but it also had an API key. And that API key um, was compromised by a third party that we identified later. Uh, and we started digging into the problem because like, the, the people in that company really took care of that service account, but API key is just like a play text credential that you put somewhere and use it in order to consume a service. Well, when did we hear about that problem in human identity? 15 years ago, maybe. So we started tracking it down. We observed all of the compute environment of that organization, started to analyze the infrastructure. You see, we started segregating like, okay, that API key usually comes from this NAT gateway. It comes from this account. Okay, so we narrow it down to like 200, 500 machines, something like that. We start um, scanning the, the snapshot of all, those, of the, all, all of those machines. We identify a certain machine that we suspect that, uh, that was the machine that was compromised. Also a very, very hard test that is nothing like uh, human identity. We took the code from that machine and identified the GitHub repo that it comes on. We scanned the GitHub repo and we signed the API key there. We rotate it. The event is over. Everybody is happy. Nobody gets fired. Great success for everyone. But you can't see a scenario like that in human identity. It just doesn't happen because like you don't have 500, much, 500 humans using the same account. Sometimes you have, but like it's very, very rare. In non human identity, it happens all the time. And I can keep on and on of how the technology is different, but I think that this case study proves that like it's an entirely bypassing uh, attack vector that is not covered by ITDR, not covered by IJ, not covered by IDP, not covered by PAM. Yeah, no, that that's a really smart approach. Yeah, I'm always very much um, wired to think about, okay, what is it going to take to get this solution in place? So I'd like to talk about like, you know, what does a project look like? But also, if you've got, if somebody who's listening right now is interested and wants to give it a try, you know, where did they start? And then what does this look like from a full implementation project effort? Yeah. So we have an entire philosophy for that, which I will say is our dear listeners for my listening to to me talking three hours about software development. So I'll say it very, very plainly. Building software is the best thing in the world. You need to do it quickly and you need to use any technology that you want. And I even want to encourage everyone to build the, the, the to use the most cutting edge technology that they, that they want. What my purpose is, is to allow them a framework to do it safely. And safely doesn't mean slowly. We aim for speed. We aim for a quick deployment. To see the value as quick as, as you can, but also to prevent ourselves from ever being in the middle. We are an integration based product. So that means there are no clients, no agent, no central dashboard that you need to document any identity that you created. We operate from the side and just allow you a peace of mind that you could go sleep well, wake up tomorrow and build the best software that you can. And so if you have, if you can use multiple clouds, use Kubernetes, 
Okay, so let me use a vault because mm-hmm. let's face it, it's like we're not going to have a machine identity uh, provider uh, anytime soon. So use a vault to vault your credentials and use Snowflake and Databricks and uh, uh, Google uh, Cloud Query and everything that you can in order to make your software as best as, as it can. And I'll take care of the security, at least from the identity part. That's true. Really so, makes a lot of sense. Go, I'm sorry, Jeff. Well, I was just going to ask, you, you, so you've got this set up, like what's the information that comes out of this? Like, how do I use this to do all those things with the speed yeah. that, that I need to? Mm-hmm. Um, so first of all, I think that the best security co- products give you peace of mind. I think that um, when I installed, uh, uh, I don't know, like for example, an EDR in my company, I had peace of mind that like, I think that my work, workstations are secure. So I think that a good security product not necessarily operates in the background, but operates in a way that's not bothersome for uh, the organization. So you do have a dashboard that you can look in, but I see like that we attach ourselves to your organizational workflows, uh, whether it's a ticketing system, a SIM, uh, also our solution, or just send your notifications via Slack. But first thing that we do is where we build an inventory. You can see in one place, all of the non-human identities that you have, all of their entitlements, all of their authentication methods, uh, the owners of those identities and the usage that uh, you do it. On top of that inventory, we provide multiple applications. Most popular application to start with is to reduce risk. You want to identify the top 10 uh, most critical identities. We like it to call it the most wanted, like the identity sheriff is coming to town and trying to like uh, ma- ma- like to catch the, the biggest criminal. So that's like the most wanted board. And and take, share, uh, is that domain name taken? Because that might be one you want to jump on next. <laughs> we have we have something here. Yeah. I'll <laughs> follow up like right after this recording and check that if that domain is available. Um, I think that Jim is doing it right now, but you know, not to point fingers. So first of all, you want to reduce risk. You want to identify the top ten uh, identities that you have and uh, delegate the the management of those problems to the teams that are responsible for them. Second part is to start going into a life cycle process. You want to be sustainable. It's impossible to all, only like us uh, do fire sighting. You want to have a place that you can track the recently created identities, the use that I, that um, machines and people do with non-human identities to track misuse, to identify uh, compromise and the point that you need to rotate a credential or reduce the permissions and eventually Every software product becomes deprecated. You have tons of story stale identities, um, and you could remove them just like by filtering out on our inventory and start to deactivate those that are no longer in use, which is a big part of the non identity fabric in organizations. So I'm curious, I just want to ask a little more detail around the attribution part. How do you how do you determine that responsibility or that ownership over an account are you i guess how do you infer that is that secret sauce or is there something that that you can maybe explain how that works uh, jeff when you go to a magic show you ask the magician how we got the girl into i two. do but you, i should not be at a magic <laughs> show for that very reason <laughs> yeah so security should be transparent um we like a lot of the the uh, the companies, people, and the people that I work with are people that are coming from backgrounds such as myself, but are other times more talented. And what we did is that we gathered a lot of know-how from both detection response phase, from people that uh, were um, in cybersecurity startups in Israel and tried to create a team like the Power Rangers of uh, not even identity security, and then use that method in order to collect data from different sources. It could be infrastructure as code uh, repositories. It could be MTM and SSO activity logs. It could be um, the audit trail of the uh, um, the services that you use um, and network data and whatnot. Compile all of that data and fuse it into one model that is the, use, the usage that is on top of the, uh, of the inventories and then use that, that like identity timeline in order to identify both changes in the identity and who was the originator of them. Like, so who did the commit that eventually provisioned it, this identity via Terraform, for example, or who clicked the button of creating an access key. 
Um, and second part is the day-to-day -day use of accessing resources um, and identifying like the the entire attribution piece of what do you access, why did you access that, and from which workload or device did you do that. So how do I? So I'm interested, right? I want to learn more about this. Is this something that um, are there videos or labs or something like that? Is it best kind of described in person? Like, what's the best way for people to actually see this in, in action? Yeah, I, I think that most of that identity, like, like the non-human identity stuck today in organization is hidden from a lot of people. And I think that um, we as a company should provide more resources for people to see, like even open source and stuff like that to start to see their non-human identity fabric. But eventually it's best to like to, to book a demo and to see it with on data that you that you want to check out and like pick, pick a sandbox environment and now we would show you that there's 50 times the amount of learning and identity that you thought um by just like scanning and integrating into right path. so i think that like that's the best way to go that sounds like a challenge so i would encourage people to go and go and take yeah. take you know, up on that challenge uh we'll put yeah. a link in our show notes so people can get to it again easy website token.security um last question for you around this topic is is the is the idea of ROI, yeah. right? People are investing money into security tools and they want to be able to show the ROI in it. How do your customers measure success with your product? Um yeah. Um that's a great question. I think that we found three metrics that empirically proved that the customer has succeeded. Um and that we agreed upon, but it's still like an area that we're learning. So what are the those three methods? First of all, you want to be smart. Being smart is not uh, putting yourself in trouble that you don't need to and just cutting all of the low hanging fruits and bringing them back home. So for example, um, when we see a customer um, deactivate all of its stale identities after 90 days of being stale, that's a very, very good sign of succeeding of identifying like what's the biggest portion that I can take with the least amount of effort. So that's one part. Second part, or second metric is modernization. We like to help our customers upgrade their non human identity stack. We identify unsurrated local identities. That's a bad, like a, an anti-pattern that has been around for years. Local database users, uh, API keys that are uh, maintained like only locally and so on. And we like to help our customers move from an unfederated identity to a federated identity. Because I do think centralization is, is key. It's not possible for all of the technologies because a lot of vendors didn't build the ability to use federated access. But when we see the amount of unfederated identities decline and the, um, the identity stack getting more and more modern, that's a very, very good sign for success. Last part is to take a problem that everybody and bashes the head in the wall in order to, to succeed is rotating a key. I think that the rotation period for keys in organization is much too long. I think that since, for example, public infrastructure solved it with expiry dates, so we created a lot of efficient uh, processes to make that work. And in non-human identity, you don't have that because you don't want to crash production because you didn't change the certificate or so. And so what I measure success with is whether I helped my customers improve between 60 to 80 to 90% uh, of the, the median time to rotate a key. Did you have, like, did you identify the owner that created that key? Did that owner get all of the data that they needed about who is using that key? And was the uh, process operationally efficient? That's like a very, very key uh, metric that we measure. I think that's going to be very helpful for a lot of people <laughs> trying to trying to figure things out for them. Um, yes. This has been very helpful, at least at least for me. I hope others got um, you know a, uh, entertainment as well as education about this. Definitely yeah. visit the website token dot security. Um, it's it, I mean it looks and sounds like such a cool product. I'm I'm interested to learn more mm -hmm. as we go along uh, with the conversations. But we want to pivot the conversation here a little bit to something that's yeah. near and dear to my heart. And you mentioned it earlier in the show about online video games. So I'm a big um, online gamer. Uh, World of Warcraft is my current uh, poison, okay. if you want to call it that. I understand you also play online. What's uh, What are you up to these days when it comes to online gaming? 
Um, so I think that I moved it in so many different games because I think that every game is good in its own way. But I think mm-hmm. that I discovered that my persona in online gaming has changed very, very dramatically. So I'll give you an example. When I, I was much younger, I used to be very cautious, I, also as a kid. And so I used to build this character of like mages that are extremely powerful ma- uh, magics, but I took a lot of time to train that character and to build it. Um, and so eventually uh, I used to spend a lot of time building and then like going to, to fight. Then mm-hmm. I reached a point in my life that I had so much uh, uh, like so much things to do that I just became the ultimate speedrunner. I'm just starting the game and like heading on all the way like to the hardest uh, raids, to the hardest parties and just trying to like die at the least that I can, but like uh, do it as quickly as I can. I just became uh, just a plain barbarian just running into uh, into the battlefield. And today, I'm in the perfect Zen condition. I became a bard. So bard is something that's like, it's just like a comical relief of the RPG world that like is there doing buffs and healing and whatnot. Um, because I just want to see people playing to be part of the, um, the experience, but also like to know that there are people that would take in the monster and I would be there cheering them on. So you're playing that's how my, the uh, yeah, exactly. <laughs> that's how my online uh, gaming persona changed over the years. So it's interesting. You mentioned the the bard character. Not many games have a bard character. My first EverQuest character was a bard, and it was fantastic. It was the whole idea of like the support character, and it kind of you know moved along over time. And it was very different from me in real life because I was not very outgoing and I was very kind of an introvert. But here I am playing this bard on you know EverQuest. And I'm in raids and. If you're an old EverQuester, you know, Plane of Fear and stuff like that, corpse runs that lasted like four to eight hours. So I, it's similar. It's I, I've kind of gone backwards from there, and now I'm, you know, more of a jack of all trades. So I may say mainly play a druid in World of Warcraft. I can kind of do everything. I'm into the paladin right now, so I'm getting into that. But I I mix and I mix and match a little bit. I'm sure that we have lost Jim completely here because Jim is not a gamer whatsoever. <laughs> I'm curious, Jim, when you hear, when you hear me say, oh, Jeff was a bard or Ido was a bard in this game, what do you think of? What comes to your head? Leroy Jenkins. <laughs> yes. Yeah. That's Will of Warcraft for you. <laughs> yeah. I, I, yeah. I don't always is... anything easier than charge it into yeah. that whelp room. I, I know exactly where that took place and it, it is exactly. absolutely what it was. Yep. Leroy Jenkins was a gamer. Don't think that's me. funny. What, yeah. What was that? <laughs> Leroy Jenkins was Persona 2 for me, like the <laughs> like the middle one where I used to speed on things uh, all the time. Yeah. I so Jeff, you're right, not a gamer, but I do appreciate the fact that you know you need to have some kind of escape. You know, you just can't like just work all the time or deal with like the stresses of life. You have to have something that takes you out of that for a little bit of time and provides some relaxation or some entertainment. So hopefully the identity center podcast can be that for some people. <laughs> uh, but if not, then gaming, I think is a pretty cool thing. So Jim, what kind of character would you want to play in a sort of an online role playing game? Like what, let's, you know, let's help him out. Let's try to figure out what kind of class he might be. Like, what would you want to do? <laughs> Look at him, like this man is pure strength and power. Like he's a classic barbarian, barbarian all the way, it. right? Yeah. <laughs> and they might have a soft sword inside. I don't know. <laughs> Jim, what do you want to do? Was like, that? You want to do you want a tank? Mm-hmm. Do you want to be like the guy in front with the shield and the sword and sort of taking the brunt yeah. of damage? Do you want to be uh damage? I'm I'm so I'm gonna get the holy trinity here of uh of character classes, but you've got the tank, the healer, the DPS, and you might say crowd control is a force out there, but we'll just call it that. Like, what's your, what do you have an affinity towards to? Mm. So I, I did play Dungeons and Dragons when I was a kid, right? And that has, you have your character <laughs> with all the different strengths. Like you could be charisma level two or strength level five or speed. <laughs> and I always <laughs> like to be like low. a good, uh, yeah, right. But I'd always like to be like a, well, charisma, it's like a two out of 10, believe me. <laughs> but um, <laughs> as far as like, I want to 
to have a character that was well balanced. Okay. Um, and then the other one that was kind of like, as far as I would go from a fantasy perspective was sorcerer. So you could like throw spells on people. That seemed <laughs> like totally unrealistic. So you mean that's not real magic, throwing fireballs <laughs> and frost bolts and all that kind of stuff. I'm sure some people <laughs> believe it's real. <laughs> you know, I'm thinking he sounds to me an awful lot like a ranged caster type of sort of role. A magician, I a mean, mage, a sorcerer, a, a warlock, maybe something like that. Look, as, as long as everybody's playing mm -hmm. and like getting their energy and uh, into the right place, like do whatever you want. <laughs> That's it. I'm down with that. All right. Why don't we go ahead and wrap up there? We've solved so many problems today. We got into machine identity and we also figured out Jim's uh, class when it comes to playing a, a role playing game. So mission accomplished as far as I'm concerned. Uh, definitely want to encourage people go visit token.security. It's first of all, hats off. Congrats. It's such a good website. <laughs> so um, definitely encourage people to go check it out. Um, loving the animations and stuff that you've got on there. So good stuff. We'll have a link in our show notes to make it easy for people to find. You know, we'll also put a link to your LinkedIn profile. People have questions. They want to reach out. Um, you know, definitely take advantage of that. Yeah. And then as far as Jim and I are concerned, yeah, visit us on the web, idacpodcast.com. Uh, we're on YouTube, idacpodcast.tv. And uh, thanks, Token, for sponsoring this episode. Thanks, Ido, for joining us. And uh, we'll talk with everyone else in the next time. Thank you for hosting me. I had the best time. You've been listening to Identity at the Center. We hope you've enjoyed the show. Make sure to like, rate, and review. And we'll be back soon. But in the meantime, hit the website at identityatthecenter.com. See you next time on Identity at the Center.